other. We saw them trying to wrestle each other. <laughs> so you might want to jot down a few of those behaviors because they can be really mean to each other. <laughs> no joke. I mean, we saw them eating each other. Mm. So, so let's just recap. What have we learned already? What do we already know about the roly polies? Yeah. Well, their characteristics of laying, um, I guess, laying still, the orientation of how they lay still. Okay. What if just general anything that we talked about? They so have well. gills. <laughs> they have gills. So we think that they're related to aquatic, you know, isopods in the past mm -hmm. so they have to have moisture, moisture to breathe and um, we can look at them and what, what do we see about them physically if you were to describe them to someone how would you do that gray less than a centimeter yeah. uh, um, um, their antennas are maybe one fourth or the size of their whole bodies okay they have um, striations in their back Right, so those are actually segments, so they can actually move mm -hmm. their backs, mm -hmm. and um, they have lots of legs. Yeah, their legs look like kind of like little needles. Yeah, and so their bodies are like kind of like one piece with little tiny eyes. Mm -hmm. So you know, as you read, you will want to cite, to write a citation for any of that type of information that you find, because check, probably people have study these in detail, like we've already seen some of them, like I think it was your article where it had some drawn out to show you what they look like. Um, it's better to not use somebody else's drawings. <laughs> the best thing to do would be to take a photograph for yourself, mm -hmm. um, since we've got them, um, if you want to show what they look like, or even the different color patterns, like what colors do you see on yours? gray to like maybe a dusty looking black mm -hmm. and some browns and tans. Yeah, so some of them are kind of mottled looking and some of them are more solid looking. So again, all these things, you know, are um, some of it you could just visually describe and others you would want to make sure you're citing it, like the number of legs and maybe the different species and maybe the historical part where we know that they um, probably came from animals that used to be 100% aquatic where they had to depend on the water and now it's less of a dependency. Those are sorts of things that you would want to cite. And some of the babies are different in various well, I mean, versus the adults. Like some of the babies are brown with a black stripe and of course the adults are just fully colored. Because they had babies last spring and um, the babies were white. Wow. Isn't that weird? But again, you know, as we go through the semester, we'll, we'll see. Hopefully, they'll survive and they'll be okay um, for y'all to do your experiments. But, but they, you know, they are kind of interesting. Okay, so um, I'm sure it's been close to 10 minutes, and so let's um, let's move to S3 activity A2. 
Now, technically, this is about orientation behavior, um, but let's let's talk about you know let's make a hypothesis and all that before we get started. So. It says what we're going to do is observe isopods as they respond to humidity differences in their environment over time. So we already know the procedure is basically going to be, you know, you've got your chamber set up, and what they want you to do is to put um, five bugs on each side. But before we do that, what we'll do is we'll saturate, you know, one side of your chamber with a certain number of drops of water. Now, don't do it quite yet. Okay. But the idea is, it's not there. I don't want any puddles in there because their legs are really short, and I've drowned them myself sometimes um, unintentionally, especially when usually I separate them out in the beakers for the students. But this semester I'm going straight from lecture to lab. I will not have time to do that. So hopefully the students won't kill them getting them out of that thing. But um, but you know the idea is they need moisture, but don't necessarily like to be submerged in water. So I guess take the drops and make them like. I would do it until the whole thing, yeah, because you know it's a filter, so it's going to absorb and mm -hmm. spread out. So, you know, again, if you decide to do it this way for your um, experiment, you know, think about, you know, it's not necessarily the number of drops, maybe, as you're just adding enough drops to completely saturate the filter. You know, think about how you would describe this to somebody else. Because um, at first, like, so when Nikki did it, and y'all are reaping the benefits of someone else having already done this, which is kind of good because that's what you want to do in research is build upon what other people have done and not have to reinvent the wheel every time. But, you know, we started off with counting and then she realized it didn't always work because, I mean, these droppers, I mean, you know, you're squeezing it. So if you squeeze a little differently or if the bottle gets low, you're going to get different size drops. So that that's where we were just, we just finally got generic where it was like, add enough drops to saturate you know, the area, so the filter. So again, we're not going to do the 30 second ones, but let's flip on over to the next page, because really in a good experiment, we've got background information now. I mean, we've already learned a lot by observing the roly-polies and by reading some basic information about them. And so um, when we look at our setup, we're timing them, right, for 10 minutes. We're going to keep data on every minute of those 10 minutes on which side, wet or dry. So now we need to make a prediction. So we're testing whether or not they like the water. So how would you state that? What would you predict? Do you think they're going to like the wet side or the dry side? I would say the wet side because they're accustomed to a moist environment. Okay, so you need to make that as a prediction. Okay under the hypothesis. Right, and so we're tracking it every minute, but we really want to know maybe at the end of the 10 minute period where more of the roly-polies will be. What is the independent and the dependent variable? Yeah, we'll come back to that. Okay. Would that be considered a natural environment? The moist mm -hmm. environment? Again, for today, if you have to use the word I, I predict you can, but it's it's better to try to get used to being more more general. Choice chamber? Yeah. Or you can just say chamber. Okay. Whatever you pick from that point on reference it like saying we ordered you know or the school ordered choice chambers from Carolina blah 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 and then you can say you know they will be from you, know, you don't always have to say we can just say chamber or whatever you decide to call them once you've established that that's what you're calling them and maybe you have a picture of them so people can see what you're talking about it's sometimes a picture is easier than trying to describe, oh, yeah, they look like two Petri dishes with a hallway in between. You know, that's kind of 
what, you know? But when you see a photograph of it, it's like, okay, and now you can say chamber. Or if you always want to write out choice chamber, just be consistent. Okay. All right, Hillary, what's your hypothesis? My prediction is that the roly polies will prefer the moist side of the choice chamber. Okay. Kendra, what'd you put down? I got to it too much. No, that's fine. Um, Southwest natural environment has characteristics of moist locations, therefore the selection of the wet side of the chamber will be of a higher choice than the dry side. Okay, so put it in a little bit more plain English. The first part is good, but then you need to predict that there will be, because we're counting, so we'll say that there will be more sow bugs on the wet side of the chamber than the dry side. Yeah. By the end of, or at the end of the experiment. So tell me again how you worded your story. I said that they will all prefer the moist side okay. of the choice chamber. So. Okay, and then say it, you know, at the end of the experiment. Because we're not really doing each ten, each one minute increment. We're actually looking at it over the period of the entire ten minutes. Okay. And you could actually state if you know, like for this short little experiment, you could say at the end of a ten minute period, because we know we're limiting our experiment to that. Okay. But again, for a regular one, that's probably too specific. Isopods, a single pod? <laughs> but that they're the same. Oh, they're the same? Okay. Same legs. I guess it's that they have the same number of legs on each side. Look at him. That big guy is really intimidating now. Yeah. All right, so tell me again what you've got, Kendra. Sow bugs' natural environment has characteristics of moist locations, therefore more sow bugs will select the moist side of the chamber at the end of the experiment. Say that last part one more time. Will what? Will, um, will select the moist side of the chamber at the end of the experiment. Okay, that's fine. So like the way she started hers is kind of like the whole purpose of your introduction. Mm -hmm. Okay. But again, for my class, you'll probably have a little bit longer introduction than you might normally because I want it to be like a three to five page paper. Okay. So what y'all will need to do is to make an outline of things that as you read through some of your introductions of these papers that you've started to get, and we'll do it again on Wednesday together, that and we've already talked about, you know, there, what would what they would call their evolutionary history. We've talked about um, their natural environment. You know, we've talked about some of their physical characteristics. And so as you read and as you get more specific to your, your topic, you, know, you can branch off. Like Nikki just happened to find a whole lot on mating. It really didn't have a whole lot to do with her topic. Mm -hmm. But because she found it and she'd already spent a lot of time investigating it, then that was part of her introduction, and, and so that's fine. Okay. And really, you know, as y'all read, you'll find, just like with any animal, that mating and all that can be a type or a means for, or reason for aggressive behavior. And so she was still able to tie that in to some of what she observed. You know, so, you know, try to keep it as related to your topic as possible, but that's not necessarily <laughs> doesn't have to necessarily be why you incorporated it. All right, so the second question is, what serves as a control? So there's really two different ways you can look at this. Um, what are what what's our variable here? The moist and non-moist. Right. So the the presence of water, adding the water is the is a variable. Okay. So again, there's two different ways because you asked me about this when you formulated your hypothesis. There's two different ways you can think about what side of your chamber is going to be the control. So what would you say based on how you wrote your hypothesis? So read your first part of your hypothesis statement again. Um, Starbucks natural environment has characteristics of moist location. Okay. So the way you worded that, then to keep it the same, would that be the moist or the dry side? Moist. Moist. So the way she worded it, she needs to say that her control is her moist side because that's what they're naturally in. 
okay? But you could also look at it from the other perspective and say, well, but I added the water. So some people will say the dry side is the control because nothing was that's, added. Yeah, that's what I kind so of thought. So either one is correct. Okay. Okay, so that's why I'll, I usually want you to explain. Because, you know, either, either one, it, it's true, you know. Okay. It's going to be that I put moist. For your control group. It, it uh -huh. will be the moist. Right. And then, you know, if you want to say the opposite, Hillary, that's fine. Well, I don't. It doesn't Because it, it asks what needs to be done to establish a control. And uh, moistening one side is an action that I can write down. Yeah, so. I mean, but really, I mean, I'll, I'll take either answer. Okay. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm not grading these sheets. Y'all will just get participation credit for doing this today. But um, obviously, this is really crucial to understanding how to set up your experiment. <laughs> We're not going to get specific for this. I mean, we're going to use tap water. I mean, if you want okay. to be more specific than that on your actual experiment, that's fine. Okay, we haven't taken our data yet, so we're going to stop at this point. Let's go back up to our variables. So don't get an experimental variable confused with what we're calling an independent or dependent variable, okay? Because um, our experimental variable in this case is, you know, the dry side or the water, however you view it, okay? The presence of water is one thing. It's the only thing that we're going to be different between the two sides. So remember, as you set up your real experiment, you only want one difference between, you know, all your setups or especially between your two sides of the chamber. So it's either going to be like what Josh is saying about pH or moisture levels or light levels, whatever. But everything else needs to be considered a constant, not a control, but a constant. So everything else will be the same because, you know, we were talking about, you know, well, if we feed them, if we put certain food and all this other stuff, as long as we all treat them the same, then they're all con that, those variables would be constant. We wouldn't need to worry about it. You might just want to describe that as part of your, of your methods, that they were kept in chambers, in the lab, they were chosen at random. You know, they were, what I do is I spritz them every morning and then before I leave on the weekends. And then um, we can talk about whether we want to feed them carrots or potatoes or whatever um, as a food source, but they will eat just the dirt and sometimes they'll eat the paper towels. Um, but as long as we keep it the same throughout the experiment, like if we decide we're going to feed them potatoes, then we need to feed them potatoes throughout the entire experiment. Because um, if we change it to carrots, we don't know how that could impact them. So that's important for y'all to realize. Far is what type of potato and what size is Pieces Unless you're, if you're doing food and as your one, then that would probably be important. Okay. But other than that, it, it's, it's probably not just potato slices or potato slice. cubes or, because we do have those, um, and I didn't, because we just got them Wednesday and I was afraid. I wanted them to adjust to their, maybe we got them Thursday, but we got them right there last week. I didn't want to give them food without having adjusted to the new soil and all that. So I've got the potato over there, and we have potatoes here. Usually we never even finish using all of them. So probably what I'll do is I'll start feeding them potatoes because, you know, they keep longer. Like carrots, you know, they'll get slimy, or sometimes they'll just completely dry out um, in the refrigerator. So what I'll probably do is start adding them potatoes. So that's probably going to be our choice. So, so if somebody else chooses to do food, you can, but our constant with – them being in their chamber will be the potato, okay? Um, so we set up our experiment, or they set it up for us really, but to where we're measuring, what are we counting? From how many are either on the dry side or on the moist side. Right, so how many isopods are on the dry side versus the wet side? And we're doing that over a period of time, right? Mm -hmm. 
So really, okay, so when we talk about an independent versus dependent variable, the independent variable is the one you can manipulate. The dependent variable is um, basically what you're counting, and it's dependent upon the independent variable. So the dependent would be the cell block? Okay, so the dependent isn't just the sow bugs. What about the sow bugs, or what are you counting? The amount on either side. Right, the number of sow bugs on e in each chamber. So that is your dependent variable. So the independent variable is what? What you the can manipulate. Yeah. So yeah, the, so it's the presence of moisture. Yeah, the presence, mm -hmm. yeah. Right, or you could say wet, dry versus dry side. You know, because we manipulated that. But the number of sow bugs depends on the moisture level. Okay. But that's what we're testing. And that's what we're hoping for. And that's why we have our experiment. Okay, so we think that because they're used to living in a natural moist environment, that when we set up our experiment, our artificial, you know, habitat or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, that we'll end up with more on the moist side. And I'll tell you that this side hasn't been spritzed at all. So you guys have sow bugs that haven't been spritzed since Thursday. So y'all will probably really be wanting the moisture, but, but we'll find that out. So that's why, you know, unfortunately, you know, on a Monday, we might, ne not, ne might not necessarily um, be able to regulate that because this, this building is closed Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so it's not like one of us could just run up here and spritz them. But that's why we give them moist potato chunks. We can maybe spray the soil and try to keep the soil moist, that sort of thing. But other than that, it, it makes it really difficult to control every single little aspect. All right, so what I want y'all to do then is to um, flip back to the data table. And you'll just have to keep an eye on the timer. I'm sorry, but we don't have timers that we can set to beep every minute or anything like that. But So every, every um, top of every minute, for 10 minutes, you're going to keep track of that. So um, can I put your water? So go ahead and put water on one. kind of spread it around, but try not to overdo it. And it's good if you can keep it as flat as possible because they really do like to, um, if it buckles at all, and I know on the dry side you can't really manipulate that, but if it buckles at all, then um, they can crawl up under there. <laughs> okay. So you might just want to take your hand and like mash it flat or something. So then um, put five on each side, and as soon as you do that, go ahead and start the timer. So you'll need to re-zero it and start from scratch. And do I put the lids back on as well? Yes, they will. They will Crawl try out. to be, but yeah, they're like little skate artists. Okay. <laughs> what is the flattest side? I don't know if it really makes a whole lot of difference. So yeah, I mean, and even handling it, like if we have oils or lotion on our hands, Sometimes, you know, those are things that we want to try not to handle them or try to handle them equally. So try to do either five on each side or what we figured out was easier is just to put all ten in the middle and then let them just go from there. Okay. Well, I couldn't get them in the middle. And then start your time once you get the legs on them. And make sure you have so them. So what we already observed is that they're probably just going to scurry around a lot. 
and then they should start settling in somewhere. Can I start your timer? And this is every minute, right? Yeah. And I will recommend that y'all always keep these screwed. All right. So at zero, put down what side of the chamber you started them off with. Because you, you did it yours in the middle, so mm -hmm. just say zero, zero for you. For her, she should say ten and zero. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quiet. What if I have one in the... In the middle? Yeah. We didn't count in the middle. We just, if we had less than ten, it's because we knew somewhere in the middle. Okay. Thank you. 